Okay, again, I'm Emil. I joined Society in 2017. My expertise is mobile. I'm mainly focusing on iOS, but over the years I've learned a lot of different things. So I know a bit about Android. I know a bit about cross-platform development tools. And I know a little bit about uh, web development. Um, during all this time, I, I've always been convinced that accessibility is an important subject. So the topic for this time will be about accessibility, focusing on mobile, and also focusing on web. So that's what the presentation will be about. Uh, we have a few topics. Well, the introduction, we have assistive technologies on mobile, and a short section about designing accessible web apps and sites. And we have a little live coding deep dive where we will make our small website work properly on mobile <clears throat> and implement some accessibility things. Um, during the last more or less 10 years, a mobile phone website traffic has grown explosively. A lot of people are using their phones, most or most. Some people don't even have a real computer anymore. They just have a phone on which they do everything, sometimes a tablet. And over 50% of website traffic worldwide at the moment is mobile. And that's not including apps. So in reality, this number is even bigger. This is purely focusing on web. That means that if you make a website, you have to make sure that it works properly on mobile and is accessible there. <clears throat> um, I'm not going to deep dive into all the accessibility guidelines, this presentation, mobile accessibility and accessibility for websites in general. Um, you have the WCAG, the Web Content Accessibility Group Guidelines. They specify everything for making your website work with screen readers and everything so that it becomes accessible for most assistive devices. Um, well, on mobile, we have a bit of a, of a strange case, of course, because the screen is smaller, the devices are battery powered, you have limited power, limited memory, limited everything. And because most people completely rely on their mobile nowadays, there's a lot of assistive technologies available on the mobiles. Um, you can do it via the chat or you can just shout and unmute for a bit. But if you think about accessibility, what comes to mind? What technologies? Let's do it in the chat, by the way. OK. <laughs> I will set up the meeting uh, so they can uh, unmute themselves. Still wins, I see. People can unmute themselves uh, right now as well. But can we hear them? Yeah, I hope so. <clears throat> uh, Emil, the moderator, can you uh, check if we hear people? One way to find out. <laughs> see this. Yes. And I can the chat niet zien. I see Delaware, Bootstrap, CSS. Yeah, but those are not assistive technologies. Oh. I'm more thinking about things like a screen reader or larger fonts or things okay. like that. We see screen reader now in the chat indeed. Maybe some nice tools in web. Could so, be. Uh, uh, your own style sheet could yeah. be one thing, for instance, <laughs> where you make things more readable for yourself. Uh, another thing could be a high contrast setting on your device, oh. or maybe inverting colors or a darker color scheme if you're sensitive to light. Uh, settings like reduce motion. If you get motion sick, you can turn off animations on mobile. I see voiceover in the chat. VoiceOver is yeah. indeed uh, one. a version of screen reader that works completely on everything on your mobile, including apps and websites, which is pretty great. Subtitles. Subtitles for videos, definitely. Are any of us relying on these technologies ourselves? It's I rely on dark mode, but <laughs> yeah. uh, subtitles are you really like it when subtitles are uh, in the video, for instance? Yes, definitely. Yeah. yeah. I myself tend to 
to zoom in on web pages a little bit often because I think the text is just too small to read. For apps, it's okay, but websites are usually scaled down quite a lot and that makes it harder to read. So I zoom in a bit. Um, <clears throat> I see here in the chat as well, uh, landscape and portrait mode. Yeah, making things a bit different aspect wise, easier to read. It's a valid one. Smart, good ones, keep them coming. <laughs> Well, let's take a look at what's inside iOS for assistive devices. So a lot of stuff is built in. We have a screen reader for apps and websites in the form of voiceover. You can set your text size and style. You can make text thicker if you have problems with contrast. So fatter letters are easier to read. You can change colors, contrast, things like that. There's a special filter for color blindness so that you can see uh, red and green contrast, for instance. It will show up as different colors, but at least you can see the difference. Uh, what we mentioned before, settings for motion. For people that are have autism, they can be sensitive to motion and motion sickness. Um, of course, you can speak text selectively, so you can select something and say, speak, say this. And describing what you see, sometimes that's possible for video content also, where it's not just subtitled, but also sort of visually transcribed. Um, there are things like assistive touch. If you have limited motor capabilities, like uh, Parkinson's or stuff like that, you can control your mobile in a different way, via a keyboard or via a switch panel or via a braille reader if you want, or it just, it's just less sensitive to taps, things like that. And of course you have alternate input methods, voice uh, control, which I forgot to mention, but that's one that I use quite frequently also. And I think a lot of us do, because when you're in the car and you want to call somebody, it's easier to just shout uh, call person instead of saying, uh, well, I go on the touch screen and I do all kinds of things and I crash into a tree halfway. So, um, and if you look at it like that, we are often handicapped in a lot of ways without even realizing it. In the car, because you're distracted, you cannot read large amounts of text. You cannot control the device uh, properly. If you're in public transport and you have a heavy bag in one hand, you're basically using it one-handed. So you have limited control over where you can tap, uh, things like that. If you're in bright sunlight, the screen pen can be hard to read. So color contrast becomes more important. And if you look at that, all the assistive technologies are not just for, for people with handicaps, they also benefit ourselves. They benefit everybody, basically. Um, well, this is more of the same, basically. Support for hearing aids, telling the user what the phone hears. That's also a nice thing. If you have a hearing aid that's supported and your phone hears the sound of an ambulance, it can alert you in a different way than just by sound, by vibrating and giving you a message like there's an ambulance coming. It's really nice technology. And of course, subtitles for multimedia content. Um, and you can set up this stuff per app. So if you want one app in, in particular to operate in a different way, you can do so. Um, in this screenshot, I've been using iOS. Android has similar support. It will be named a little bit different. Some things are there that are not on iOS and the other way around, but it's more or less the same thing. Um, designing accessible web apps. I think this is a very recognizable scenario for all of us, where the person making the website has definitely not thought about the small screen and you just cannot tap things properly. You have to be really precise in closing things or just tapping buttons or links or whatever. Um, when you make something for mobile, you can build on what you know. A website is a website, so you can use the Web Content Accessibility Group guidelines. It will help on mobile also. Of course, it helps if you use responsive design. That means that if you have things like an iPhone that by default requests a desktop site, make sure that you handle the small screen properly. Uh, the screenshot shows two versions of Google, one where I set it explicitly to request a mobile site and the other one is the desktop site. And you see that the left one where it requests a desktop site is actually quite small. And if you want to use it, you need to zoom in a little bit. 
they could have done that a little bit differently. Um, because the screen is small, you want to use a low information density. You don't want to have lots of text, lots of small text. And you want large touch targets, so you don't get the scenario in the last slide where you have to really precisely maneuver over something. Usually phones are smart in that if you misstep a little bit, it will pick the nearest link, but still, if you have a bunch of them, yeah, it's not perfect. Um, how to test your website for accessibility? Uh, you can use the responsive design tools in Chrome. It's actually quite a nice substitute for having an actual small screen, and you can test on different device sizes and everything. If you have Safari on a Mac, you can connect to an iOS device and you can run the website on your device. And there are some extensions available for testing accessibility. It's a nice setup, but you do need a Mac and you do need Safari. If you see how people use the phone, you see that a lot of phone use is single-handed. That means that half of the links on especially larger devices are not reachable with one hand. Uh, Two-handed use is sometimes required, but it's less common, and it's even more or less common if people are using it with two hands, for instance, to write large amounts of texts. It's usually not done on mobile devices. Yeah. Uh, well, most of us are right-handed, and about 30% of the population is left-handed. So you see that reachability is usually limited to the bottom right corner of the screen. You can see that if uh, a company takes accessibility into account, on the left side you have Apple Maps, and Apple has in recent years placed the search function down on the screen. So everything that you interact with is typically usable with one hand. They don't do that for all the apps. Mail, for instance, you're usually reading it or typing mails with two hands, and so it's not so bad that it's using the whole screen. But if you're walking around in a city, Maps is made to be used with one hand only, and that makes, I think, a lot of sense. If we make web apps that are used on phones or mobiles and are for, for on-the-move use, we can also take this into account, of course, so that things are reachable on the screen. Well, we can do a really short live demo on where we start with something that's not really working on mobile to making it work properly on mobile. And then we go on to implementing some accessibility features. So, will it switch? No, of course it won't. What we have here is my beautiful homepage. Nice. <laughs> Good choice. Good choice. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> we have a bunch of kittens and they have a wonderful life. They have a bunch of lorem ipsum text because they just cannot understand what we say yet, but we still want to give them a homepage. Well, since we are just we just left the 80s, we have this wonderfully animated title bar that that's color cycles and um, and some text and we have some more text. Well, this looks pretty good on. Uh, on my browser, I think. It's wonderful. But if we look at it on the iPad, well, 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 I can live with that. It's okay. If we look at it on a mobile phone, however, yeah, yeah. This is becoming a little bit more difficult. It's hard to read, so we want to do something with that. Of course, we can zoom in, but then you have to scroll a lot, and it's a bit annoying. So let's take a look at what we made. Well. The website itself is kind of accessible. I've uh, specified a language for my HTML text, so my screen reader knows in what language it has to read the text. That's important. Um, I've used uh, headers where there are headers, so the screen reader knows what's important and what's not. I've actually put a nice alt uh, tag on my image so that the screen reader can tell the not so visible user that it's an image of cute kittens. Um, and I've used paragraphs for the screen reader to help it understand the, the contents of the site a little bit. This is all okay. It's just the visuals that go wrong in this case. So let's take a look at my style sheet. And then I have to get my cheat sheet a little bit. 
first thing I think we want to do is get rid of this, uh, this smallness of the text. So we can tell the mobile device to not scale down the website that we have made. And how can we do that? Well, we can put something in the header and we put in a meta name is viewport and we just basically viewport. We basically tell it to stop scaling it. And then is. We have a width is. And we want to set it to the device width. And we want to set it to an initial scale of one. And let's see this and then this. And then I'm missing something. What am I missing? I'm missing nothing. OK. So let's try again. Oh, this is better in the sense that I can now <laughs> actually read the text. The size is OK. That's beautiful. Progress. Progress. <laughs> However, we still have to zoom out and we have to scroll a lot and it's, it's still not that perfect. So let's see what we can do. Um, basically, we want to have the content of the site, the two columns. Uh, we want it to fit on the screen a little bit better. So in our style sheet, what can we do? Well, we have a content and we have now, we have it set to a hard-coded width of 1000 pixels. It's okay on most uh, laptops, but it's not okay on mobile. So let's change that a little bit. And we set it to 100%. That should fix it, right? Okay. Come on. Really? Yeah, definitely. It should not do that. Okay, whatever. Um, yeah, here it works. It now fits the whole screen. That's. It should be nice on mobile, but it's not so nice on the browser anymore. Because this becomes annoying to read. The bigger the get, the the bigger the get picture. Exactly. The bigger everything gets. So nah, let's change that again. So we give it a maximum width, and then that should fix the whole thing. So we give it a max width of the thousand pixels again, and that fixes it on the browser again. So it's really nice and. Yeah, it's not really nice actually if you have a narrow screen or if you have a. I don't know why this is not working anymore. Definitely demonstration effect. <laughs> the demo gods. <laughs> the demo gods are against me. Well, <clears throat> let's say we want to make it smaller or scale better for smaller screens. So it doesn't do this because this is annoying. So what can we do? Well, we, easiest way is to just add a media query and say that for certain smaller screen sizes, we change the CSS a little bit and we put the two things that are here next to each other, we put them below each other. It's the, what most of the grid-based frameworks also do. So we do at uh, add media screen and To give it a max width of about 800 pixels, give or take. Well, in the CSS, we have a left and a right. They are both set to 50% and float left. So let's change that. So dot left, dot right. Uh, we make them with 100%. So they will be put uh, below each other. Save it. Let's see what that did. It still looks okay. And once we make it smaller, it moves down a little bit. Well, spacing could be a little bit better. So let's fix that a little bit. So the one on the right. 
we give it uh, no more padding on the left side. And we give it some padding on the top. Whatever. Uh, where's my browser? Perfect. Let's see if this feels like cooperating. No, still not, of course. Uh, At least we see the cats. <laughs> yeah, but it, okay. it's not doing what it should do. Not working indeed. No, it won't reload. I've been testing this yesterday so many times. We're ready to uh, plug it in and out. <laughs> As you say, start a new one. Let's just start a new one. Does the job usually? <laughs> usually it does, right? So let's take. Oh yeah, of course it will not remember anything. Um, files, website. Demo. Ah, Look at that. <laughs> There's <worked>. our kittens. <laughs> nicely, nicely laid out. So that's the first step. Things are more readable on mobile now. And we don't have to zoom, we don't have to scroll a lot, and it's a lot nicer. Um, next up, let's see. We have this really wonderful color animated uh, title bar or title. And we get a little motion sickness from that. We are really annoyed by it. So we go to the accessibility settings of the device. Settings. And we go to accessibility. And we say movement. And we say reduce motion. That means that in iOS, you see a lot of animations are turning off. You don't see the fancy animations when you switch apps. When you open the browser again, you don't see the zoom in thing. So it becomes a much easier on the eyes. However, when we, we refresh this page, we still have the wonderful life of kittens animating. Mm -hmm. mm, it's not so nice. Well, we can do something about that because we can ask if the user has a reverse reduced motion setting enabled. So what we can add, it's another media query. Media, and it's called the first without a T. Reduced motion. You can all see what a lazy typist I'm actually. <laughs> and we can say that this animation name that we use for animation, we can set it to something non not existing and it will not animate anymore. So we do dot animate. And we override that with uh, animation name. Save it. And then hopefully the refresh gods are good for us. And we see that this motion here has stopped. Of course, this is a bit of a silly example because yeah, it's just an animated a bit of text. But you can use this to, if you serve advertisement, to serve uh, banners that are not moving, for instance. You can decide not to autoplay videos. Uh, you can decide to be a bit more relaxed on animation effects you have on buttons or screen transitions or whatever. And it's a setting that if you respect it, it's it's used by more people than you, uh, than you would think. Uh, some people because they are just annoyed by the animations and some people because they really get motion sickness. When Apple added the parallax effect to the to the home screen, where you had this background that moved a layer deeper than the than the icons that were floating on top of it, the reduced motion setting appeared in the next version of iOS because a lot of people actually complained about getting motion sickness from this stupid feature. Do you know how much uh, people have motion sickness or? The last time we measured this in an in a client's app. It was about six or seven percent who had animations turned off. Oh, so pretty huge! Yeah. Didn't expect that. <laughs> it, it's more than I expected. Yeah. Also, of course, this also still animates when you don't have the setting uh, yeah. turned on or off. 
And uh, this setting also works on normal browsers. So if I am here in my Mac setting and I go to accessibility and I go to reduce motion, it also changes here and it stops animating things. So it's not just for mobile, it's also for desktop a setting that you can use. I like it, so I'll turn it back on. Um, next up. Some people have uh, had surgery on their eyes and they are sensitive to light. Of course, this is really readable with this beautiful black text on the white background. But a lot of people prefer the dark mode. Well, here you see that in the bottom of the screen, the browser uh, reacts to it. Now I change it to light mode again. In dark mode, but our website does not cooperate with that. So we can change it to uh, to work with that. For that, we have to restructure things a little bit because it's with the hard coded color names here. It's not so nice. So we want to make a color scheme, and to do that, we set some global variables first. So we tell the browser that we have a color scheme with the right spelling. We have light and we have dark. We make a variable for the text. So my text color, uh, my text color is black in the normal case. My content background color. We can make that white because that's the main content. And we have the body background color we call that my body background color. Of course, there are different ways to reach this in CSS. You can also use something like SES or whatever you want. And we call that powder blue. OK, for the body, the background color, we use this variable that we made. So far, um, what is my body background color? So we use this. And here we also use the variable. And this is my text color. And uh, we have the content, and that also has a background color that's white. And we also made this use our little color scheme, and that's the content background color. So copy paste this here. Let's save it. And let's Test it if it still works. OK, that looks OK. On the larger screen, that looks OK. And here, oh, I've missed something apparently. What did I miss? We have the background, and we should add the two dashes. So, ah, beautiful. Perfect, just what we wanted. So, now to make a dark color scheme. We could just invert the colors, so we can make what's white, we can make black. What's black, we can make white. Oh, there's one little thing that I need to change, I see, and that's the border around this because it's following the text color. Uh, we have one more here, that's this one. We should use the text color there. So let's copy that from here. Uh, the black, the dark screen, uh, dark color scheme. So it's also a media query. What a surprise! And in this case, it's a prefers color scheme without the U. Uh, dark, sharp. And if we have a color scheme dark, we are going to set some more variables. Uh, so I'm just going to copy these because I want to override them with something else. So what a wonderful layout. Uh, text color. Let's make the text color white. Let's make the content background dark, but not pure black, because on a lot of OLED screens, if you have white text on a pure black screen and you scroll, it gives this really annoying uh, ghosting effect. So if we make it almost black. That works better. 
And uh, the very light blue that we have here, we could tone it down a little bit. So I've calculated a darker variation of that, and it's going to be four, six, five, A, no, not that A, A, C. So now, if we have a light color scheme, everything still works. If we have a device with a dark color scheme, everything still does not work. What did I miss? Anybody with good CSS knowledge that yeah. sees what I missed? Or is it just not refreshing again? Well, maybe a people in the chat can help. <laughs> just an interactive part of the presentation. <laughs> no, it's just me missing something and I don't immediately see, I see what I miss. I should not put a space there. Ah! Oh. That's sneaky, right? Well, what yeah, I see two people in the chat uh, are winners, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Very sharp of them. <laughs> nice. Anyhow, now it works in dark mode also. Of course, dark mode is a system setting on the Mac. So if I put it on uh, dark mode, that's not here, but in general. The website also responds on the desktop, which is really nice. So you see that accessibility settings are not just nice for people who rely on them. They're also nice for just, well, just following the settings of the system. It's a wonderful something. Um, last thing is that I'm a little bit short-sighted. And in my settings, in accessibility, well, I kind of rely on really big text because otherwise it's unreadable. So you see that all of iOS is actually changing. These letters are a little bit larger. If I go to my settings, things are larger. If we go to our wonderful website, you see that the browser itself is larger, but the text on our site is not larger, so I still cannot read it. It's not accessible for me. So we can also fix that. You never guess what happens, but we will add another media query. And we're going to see if we are running on a device that, in this case, is an Apple device. And has a larger font set. So we ask for, do we support this? And we can ask, do we support the font Apple system body? If so, we set on our HTML tag the font to Apple system body. And we save the thing. Then what we see is that if we refresh now, our text is a lot bigger. So our site is now not only wonderfully informative about our kittens, it's also supporting dark mode. It's supporting reduced motion, and it's readable for people who, who rely on larger fonts. And that just with a little bit of CSS. It's pretty nice, isn't it? Yeah, it amazes me every time, indeed, because it's not a lot of well work, so it's, to say. It's not a lot of yeah. work, no, and it gives a quite nice result, actually. Especially the dark mode was so much easier than I expected. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. The, the fonts, the, the scalable fonts are a little bit more convoluted because Apple sets the default styling to fonts, the default text sizes, yeah. to the font sizes that are used on the device in that case. So that means that the text that I see here also is supported by this uh, accessibility setting. And if I refresh it, you see that it becomes a little bit smaller actually, because this is the default text size for macOS. So if you use this, um, you may have to play a little bit with the with setting the default size to a uh, well. In this case, I've set it to 1.3 m. But to compensate, you may have to adjust that also a little bit. 
You can of course do that in the override if it supports this font. You can just set the text size to a larger M size to match whatever your design uh, gives you. And then you can basically, on uh, at least on iOS devices, you can scale with the user settings. And that's really nice. So that was my little short demo. Uh, of course, there are many more of those tricks. CSS tricks has a whole category on them for accessibility. And it also shows more examples on how you can use them and all the details and edge cases that you run into. Uh, to learn more about accessibility in general, both Apple and Android have really good accessibility sections. They deal not only with apps, but they also deal with web content and system settings and things like that. So that's it for this session. I'm not sure if I kept it in half the hour, but... No, it's great. It's great. Thank you, uh, Emil, and a small applause, uh, at least for you. Great stuff. <laughs> yeah, well done. <laughs> there are some few questions, indeed, in the chat. And uh, okay. also, some people <laughs> were very sharp, uh, Akash, with the root thing, the error we didn't solve. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and John as well. Miss. Yeah, it's so easy to miss, indeed. Um, but the first question from the chat is, uh, I have a Mac and an iPhone. Which plugins do you recommend? And I guess it's about how to uh, access the accessibility and how to involve it and test it maybe. I think that's the main reason for the question. So what, what do you recommend? Well, I find that hard to answer because, well, I'm not a web developer. Uh, so I, the limited stuff I do with web, I find that the, the normal content inspector of Safari is completely sufficient for me. And it shows what accessibility tags it, it used. Of course, I have an iOS device that I can use to test it on. Yeah. So basically, I just test on, on the device and see what, happen, what, what matters and what happens. Um, yeah, so I, I don't have any favorite plugins for this. I think that what Apple offers by default, for me at least, is sufficient. Exactly, and uh, I think uh, within Google Chrome, if you think about that, there are plenty of extensions that can... Uh, a lot of them, yeah. <laughs> although the built-in stuff, especially for responsive design, is also is already really nice, yeah. and it covers a lot of the basic cases. It has preset sizes for device types and things like that, so it's, it's okay as a start. Yeah. Nice one. And there's another question more related to uh, CSS variables. And oh dear. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> oh dear, we saw you naming your CSS variables. And there's a question uh, because somebody is finding it hard to name a variable. And I think we all <laughs> have that sometimes. <laughs> um, and this question is basically, uh, it's pretty hard for me to choose a global variable named to CSS, especially for dark mode. Do you use text color now and for border colors? Has anyone tips for me? And I think it has to do with general naming. Uh, yeah, well, for general naming, you see that my convention was to, to prefix them with my, uh, because I don't want to clash with anything that somebody else made. It's basically a way of namespacing it. In this case, it's my, but it could be a different prefix also. Uh, and for color names, I tend to not like to use things like uh, red, blue, green, because in dark mode, it may not be red, blue, or green. Text is black in normal mode, but it's white in dark mode. So I tend to use descriptive names. So text color and text colors could have different levels depending on hierarchy or whatever. So you could have one that's white for headers and one that's slightly gray for body text. So then I would probably name them uh, my body text, my <laughs> header text, uh, things yeah. like that. Exactly. And describing stuff is, is usually the smarter way to name them than describing what the content uh, should look like. So yeah. not red, green, or blue, or whatever. Great, right. And uh, one question for myself, actually. Um, when you go to client and stuff, how do you give this priority? So the accessibility part, because usually it's more about pumping out features, but this is a really great to see what you can do and how many people you can reach. Yes, and if you take this from the start, yes. it's <laughs> hardly any extra work. Yeah. So. I've been uh, at my previous assignment, growing a little bit of, of accessibility awareness with the team. And I've started by, by basically giving a presentation like this. Like we are all depending on accessibility, whether we want it or not, because we have different use cases for devices. 
one-handed use, things like that. In my case, it was about the app and placement of buttons and things that were too small and stuff like that. Um, and that clicked with design. So they decided to rearrange stuff a little bit and we started taking accessibility in account there. For a lot of new screens, we decided to implement dynamic type. So we scale the type, the font, according to the user setting. And if we do the layout not too complicated, uh, voiceover automatically starts to work. So that way we started at, at this client. Yeah. And about half of the app is now properly accessible. There's still a lot of work to be done. But you already made a lot of progress, right? There's a lot yeah. of progress already. Yeah, yes. Great stuff. Nice. Uh, I hope we can all use that uh, someday as well. Um, let's nice. say it, yeah, let's try for it at least. Um, and of course, for web stuff, use the web content accessibility guidelines. They are really helpful. They really make things like screen readers usable. And especially for completely blind people, they are unmissable. No. The dark mode is, is nice, but there are many more people really depending on a screen reader. Great. I think that's a great ending. <laughs> more people than we think of uh, need this. And especially uh, it's nice to have. Well, on the same client, as a last remark, we measured how many people have a larger than default font size on their phones. Yeah. And although they have a slightly older target audience, uh, it was way over 35%. So that's enough to, to really want to do something with this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 35%, that's huge, actually. Yeah. Thank you, Emil. Uh, thank you again. And we will continue because we're running a bit out of time. Um, I will share the program again, and we will probably do uh, not a break this time because we're still going in the flow. <laughs> So we just continue, I guess, but okay. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> I think that's the best way we can cover this time uh, uh, again. Sorry about that. So Sorry about that, but it was interesting, so that's great. Um, we will switch in a few seconds, but before we do that, uh, but, so before we go to Adam, actually, with the generative art, we will do another giveaway. And this is from the last time as well. So if you were last front at Lightning Talks, you already know the answer. Uh, please put in the chat what the console logs will output. So, for instance, one will output number, maybe. I don't know. Who knows? And the second one, that, what does that output? Nice. <laughs> and the last one. The first uh, few people, again, will get uh, some giveaway tickets. And after that, we will switch to uh, Adam. So put in the chat what will uh, these things output in the type. And I will give the first one away. <laughs> and that will be a string. Yes, the first one, string, string, string. Oof, that's a close one. There's one hiccup in there. <laughs> I see John again as the correct answer. String number, string. <laughs> So people really fast. Oh, number. Well, there are some plus and minus involved. So let's see what happens when a string where you do plus or minus. So I'm concatenating. I see another one. String, number, string. That's great. So I think we have our two winners. <laughs> Congratulations again. Well done. This is a bit difficult uh, because most people, of course, use the plus. So concatenation. Uh, but the minus is something we don't regularly use with strings. And you get a number for that. So that's pretty interesting. This is why you should not use yeah, <laughs> this is for, for JavaScript reasons, of course. Um, yeah, so that's also one beautiful part of JavaScript, I guess, <laughs> which you can see here as well. Uh, please contact the meetup organizers, then you will get your ticket for uh, the Flowmania part, and we will continue uh, with Adam. So Adam, uh, you can take over the screen and uh, share everything. The camera is yours. Off. The screen is off, we will uh, put that on again. Patient. It was impatient <laughs> indeed. <laughs> so that will be great. Uh, you guys can contact us via our social team or teams or just via Meetup, that's also fine. Um. <laughs> yeah, double checking it, good one, Akash. Yeah, I was also surprised when I first saw that. <laughs> but yeah.
Yeah, we have our screen in front of us and it will show the presentation as well. If not, we can already start. Adam, maybe you can already talk about a bit. Uh... Sorry, it will swap over one. On... Uh, then we will mention it, no problem. Okay. Was it on HDMI 2? Uh, no, it's one, but it doesn't really matter. We can uh, just start. If you share your screen, uh, Adam, we will figure out the TV. And then uh, meanwhile, you can do the presentation. Yeah, we see your screen right now. Yep. Yep, we see the presentation. Good luck and uh, <laughs> great. <laughs> the demo gods did not favor us today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Thanks for. Okay. And then put the sound on. <laughs> Is this all right? Is there sound now? Yeah, I guess yeah. so. Yes. <laughs> okay, let's let's go with this. All right. Uh, Technical hiccup. Uh, yeah, it happens. It happens. It happens. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um. Yes. Um. I want to start off today by uh, let's just appreciate some nice art. Uh. So let's take a look at this piece of art here. Um. Looks pretty cool to me. Uh, it gives me a bit of a dune vibe, maybe arcane if people have watched that. A uh, bit of a desert, Sahara vibe. Um, it's nice and all, but uh, it's not only me who thinks this is cool, right? It, this has won a, a competition, a uh, Colorado States Fair competition. But the, the funny thing is, it's uh, not drawn by anyone, right? This is uh, generated art by a computer, right? So this is the cool stuff that we can do with generative art. In the past couple of, let's say, months, weeks, uh, we've seen a, a lot of websites pop up, uh, a lot of websites which um, give you the possibility to put in any combination of text, which then will result in uh, some kind of uh, images. It's really fun to play with. I really recommend it. Let's say, for example, you ever wondered how it would look like if a panda went to a LAN party to play some video games. This is how it would look like, right? Or for example, you ever wondered how Shrek would do his grocery shopping at Aldi? Well, this is kind of how it would look like. There, the, some really fun stuff comes out of this, but um, it's not only about uh, the fun stuff that comes out of it, but it's really about the technology behind it because it's really interesting how this stuff has evolved um, without a lot of people really knowing about it. And then I'm not really talking about only this kind of websites. I'm also talking about uh, all the other uses for this uh, without people even noticing. So what I want to achieve today, I really want to, uh, I really hope that you get out of this presentation today and hope and and, and um, look at my demo at the end and think, hey, that's really cool. I want to try that as well. And not only try this, but dive into it and see how does this work and why is this so cool. And my goal for today is as well to show you that it's not only fun to do, 
but it's really interesting and a really cool way to um, to practice to practice your programming skills as well. Um, so this is why uh, math and programming comes comes together, right? We, we'll see that during this presentation as well. Okay. Anyhow, let's let's just uh, introduce ourselves first uh, before we uh, dive into this. My name is Adam. Uh, I've worked for several companies, mostly with React, uh, for WeRU, Synapse, and ASML currently. Uh, I've been working with React for a couple of years now, and then I stumbled upon this generative art. I found it myself really interesting and really fun to do. So I started getting into it a bit more, just with YouTube videos, just like everyone else does. And um, I found out some really interesting stuff and some really interesting uh, use cases for it as well. Um, which I'll show you at the end as well. We, we also have a really fun demo. Um, I hope you guys will like that as well. Yes, next to work, of course, after sitting the whole day behind a PC screen, uh, I, I still sit behind the PC screens, to be honest, so that's not big of a change. Uh, gaming is one of my hobbies. Uh, I try to fitness a lot, I try, um, and traveling nowadays, but uh, who knows what, what Schiphol does uh, in the Netherlands, but yeah. Um, yes. Let's dive into what generative art really is. Let's first set the definition for ourselves, right? Uh, what is it and what does count and what doesn't count as generative art? So first of, first of all, what is it? Um, it's the practice of creating systems uh, that then autonomously create art, right? This is a basic one-liner to uh, describe generative art. Let's take a look at what does count as generative art and what does not count as generative art, because that's going to be uh, quite important for our uh, journey throughout this presentation. Right? Any piece of art in which the artist uses a system, uh, such as set of natural language rules, a computer system, a machine, or a procedural invention that is set into motion with some degree of autonomy, thereby contributing to a full piece of art. Um, some really important things to pick out here. So uh, you see uh, some degree of autonomy and it's set into motion um, and there's a computer program involved or an invention or a machine, something like that. And it will result in a complete work of art. So these three things are really important for us right now. Um, to demonstrate this, for uh, to not demonstrate, but to show this, let's first take a look at some examples, right? First, a very easy example of something that is not generative art. Mona Lisa. We all know this. Um, Leonardo was a guy who who painted this, but he didn't paint one stroke of paint and then the rest went on its own. He did it all by himself from start to finish, done by a human. So this is definitely not generative art, right? Um, continue on in that. Let's take a look at something that is generative art, but we're not going to take a look at pr programs yet, right? So something like this. It's an invention. It's set into motion with some degree of autonomy. And after that, you won't have to touch it anymore and it will create a full piece of art, right? So this is what that definition really means. Um, in this case, it's not a program, but we, of course, are all nerds. We want to use our hands to, to program something. We don't want this artsy stuff with paint. Um, so let us get into that. Let's first start off with some fundamentals. I do want to clarify that generative art is not based on just these three fundamentals. It's way broader than you think it is. Uh, we'll have a quick look at that as well. But it, it's not just these three things. We, I picked these three out because it's going to give us an easy um, setup and it's going to give us some easy examples to understand what the concept itself is. And after that, we'll dive into some more interesting stuff. Um, we're going to see two examples, one example regarding randomness and one example regarding recursion and uh, shapes. Um, let's first start off with randomness. Randomness is done by, uh, we, we have an example done by P5JS on the left side. So that's the code that you see. And on the right side, you'll see the output of the code. Um, P5JS is what we're going to use for our demo in a bit, but we can ignore that for now. It's not that interesting for now. Um, the code will come later. But first off, uh, we're going to start off with a purple rectangle. Easy enough, right? So um, next up, we're going to fill this rectangle up with some squares, squares with a shade of red. So we can see on the left side, it's fill random 255. So if you know RGB, 
the R in this case is the random factor, the zero is uh, the green and the B is the blue. So blue is 128 and green is going to be zero at all times. And random in this case is going to be the red, right? So we have different shades of red, different squares on different spots. So this is the randomness involved in this example, right? But this is, at least to me, it's not really art yet, right? It's it's fun, it looks okay, but this is not going to win you a competition, right? We want to we want to create something that is actually cool. Um, to do this, we're going to add a little bit more logic to it. We're going to add a algorithm called a poly, um, polynoise algorithm. This is going to uh, create smooth transitions from one color to the other, right? There's still randomness in there. So every time we run this code, it will create a random piece of art, but there's a bit more logic to it, right? Um, depending on the, 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 the square next to it, it will generate a square with a same-ish color to create this transition, right? It's all fun and games, but what if we want to use this in real life, right? What is a real life example? What is a use case for something like this? I think most of us have seen this and heard of this thing before. It's called Minecraft. Minecraft is one of the um, um, one of the biggest examples because Minecraft does this same thing, right? You have different areas for people that don't know Minecraft. It's a game. You have different areas uh, like a Sahara area, a desert area, a jungle area, a, name it a mountain area, a, a, a snow area, water. So all these different kinds of areas um, need to have smooth transitions. We don't want any, um, I don't know, jungle in our desert, right? That doesn't make sense. So we need these smooth transitions. They use the same concept. Of course, there's more logic to it, and uh, it's way more difficult and complex, but it's the same concept. It's a form of generative art. It's randomly generated each time you start a new game of Minecraft, right? Um, okay. Next up, we're going to go over to our second example. Our second example uh, is a very short and uh, quick example, but it's regarding recursion and shapes. Um, what we can see here is something that has been created from a starting image. So you start with a singular image, you'll cut out a piece of that image, and you, you, will, you will use recursion over and over again to create a piece of art. So let's do this ourselves. We're going to take this image in this case. We're going to cut out the middle rectangle, uh, sorry, triangle from this image, uh, which will result in this. And what if we now put them next to each other, right? Uh, then we have two next to each other. What if we use these two and put six all around each other? We'll create a hexagon. And what if we put this hexagon once again next to each other? We'll create a, in, in, in pattern something like a carpet. Right, so this is also one of the concepts in generative art. Um, like I said before, it's not that everything in generative art is done by re randomness and recursion and shapes. Randomness is definitely a big part in uh, generative art, but it's not only that, right? It's way broader. Um, okay, let's go on to our coding time. Um, how are we on time? That's going to depend on how we... Time is still okay, uh, okay, but if you could close within 10 minutes, it should be fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so we are not no, okay. We, we started later, of course. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. We had some downtime, so uh, okay. I think uh, within 10, 10, 10 minutes, it's okay. Okay, no, that, that's fine. Um, then I'm going to have to be sorry, but we're not going to do live coding. So there's hopefully no chance it goes wrong. Sorry, Emil. <laughs> but <laughs> um, we're just going to do a uh, set uh, example. So I'm going to uh, take this preset of code because that's going to make it easier for me. Yes. OK. Um, what I'm going to show you today or here is going to be a example of uh, ASCII art. So this is once again something uh, with generative art, uh, but it's called ASCII art. What, what is it? We are going to convert an image to um, not colors anymore, but we're going to convert it to characters. So you've probably seen this before, but we're going to create an image uh, with characters. So any image we um, put in here, it should um, 
console or it should display a, a the same image but then with characters um, i have a couple a couple of examples uh, we're going to start off with a panda of course uh, let me just see if that's correct yes it should be uh, to, to yes okay so um, as you can see on the right side we have a panda uh, very cool uh, my favorite animal by the way but uh, the, the, um, the, the cool thing about this is we have done this in not just, um, I forgot to mention, excuse me, but we are using P5.js in this case. P5.js is a library based on JavaScript. Uh, normally you would um, use a canvas. In this case, we are using HTML, which makes it really fun because what we can do is we can copy this and we can paste it anywhere we want, right? So this is... Uh, so that's the cool thing we can do with p5.js p5.js uh, mainly adds the drawing functionality to your application uh, we are currently using the online editor um, very easy to start with very fun to, to play around with really recommend it uh, and a really nice way to uh, just train your skills a bit right your logic skills because as we can see here this is not much code right so it's about 30 lines of code which probably 10 of them are just enters right so it's not a lot of code but you can generate something that's really cool because we now have a system set up that will convert every image to sqr but it doesn't stop there right this is where it actually starts because now we can start playing around with this uh, let's say for example uh, we are going to change the different characters that are displayed um, on our image. So, for example, we see here um, we have different we have different characters like three W, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We're going to switch them around. So instead of a three, we want sometimes a W, right? Um, so that's going to give us this really cool and weird effect, right? So this is stuff that you can play around with. You can play around with backgrounds. You can play around with different colors. You can play around maybe even 3D. Why not? Um, so this is the fun part about it. Okay, let's do a quick exercise. Um, no giveaways for this, sorry. <laughs> but um, let's see if we can guess the first person in this. Uh, in this. Oh, sorry, it's a PNG. Oh, I'm gonna have to enlarge this a bit. Can we guess the first person? <laughs> I think this one is is, is quite easy still. The next one is going to be more difficult. I can't see the chat. If anyone can want to read even Musk in the chat. Okay, that, <laughs> of course, yes, that's correct. So this is indeed an image of Elon Musk. I took from online. I used it in here. Uh, the only thing I did um, is I changed the ratio from whatever pixels it was to 126, 126, but, uh, because that will give me uh, that, that will I will be able to display it on one screen, right? Otherwise, I had to copy it again and paste it here so you could see it. But it does here it work the same, right? So this is pretty cool. Um, next one, which is an interesting, uh, which is an interesting one. I don't expect everyone to immediately see this one. Um, next up, <laughs> any idea? Yes. I, yeah, I know. yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Any answers uh, in the chat? <laughs> Can you read it, right? Sorry? Mr. Reeves himself. Yeah, 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 <laughs> correct. The thing is, it's interesting, right? Because this image, um, the original image, not the original original because I scaled it down, but the original image is a black background and he has black hair, of course. He has a black T-shirt, he has a black beard. So that makes it quite difficult for our system to work with this. So to change this up, um something i haven't showed you yet is uh, at the top we have our density string the density string is um are the different characters that we want to display so the more we go to the left the brighter the color is but in this case on the keanu reeves image we don't see that much bright colors so we won't see any um at or w's or maybe dollars so those those we won't see what we will see, because it's a very dark image, are the spaces at the end. You can see there are multiple spaces there. That's because we um, 
we we set this I set this up because the panda does have a quite good contrast of black and white. So there it gives us a really nice result. In this case, because the image is really dark, it gives us a um, a bit of a yeah, less result. Let's remove the spaces for in this case because that will give us um, always the, the problem with the space, of course, is because it's nothing, right? If we remove nothing and we always show something, that means that there will always be a difference between the different colors, right? So this color is different from this one, so we will always see that. Um, so if we've changed it now, we can see, and let me do this again. We can see a quite clear picture this time, right? So we can see his hair, we can see where it starts and where it stops, and we can see the background as well. Um, oh, last one just for fun. I forgot which one it was. My oh yeah, now I remember. <laughs> And once again, we can play around to this, right? So let me add in the spaces again. Let's see what happens with that. Any idea? Yeah, no space, but not the name. <laughs> uh, yeah, I get it. Brad Pitt, our uh, oh. good friend Brad Pitt, yes. My lookalike. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no comments, no <laughs> comments, middle, no leave comments. Leave yeah, leave <laughs> um, yeah, but... Uh, this is the cool thing, right? And one last thing I want to show you about P5 itself. This is really easy to get into and to like prove you this. Something I want to do um, in the meantime, Christian, if you want to get behind me, I think that would be sure. a really cool yeah. effect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Emil, feel free if, as yeah. well if you if you feel like it. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the this really cool effect, I'm, I'm gonna in the next one minute. What I'm gonna do is instead of an image, I will show you a a uh, full video, live video, and we're going to convert that to ASCII at the same time. I'll actually use my ready one, so that's going to be a bit easier. Oh, sorry. There's this one. Panda, sorry. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. So we can see that this is a live oh, yeah. video, oh. right? Oh. So this is pretty cool. <laughs> nice one. And the only thing I actually did um, was I changed awesome. the therm uh, image to video and I added two lines. That's it. I did nothing else. So it's really easy for, uh, to, to use P5 for this kind of uh, visual stuff, right? Let me turn this one off. Um, so that's why I really recommend to try getting into this, try playing around with it at least. Um, yes, uh, enough demo. Let's get to the uh, this one. Right, yeah. Uh, lastly, I'm just going to give you some really quick use cases. Um, games are a very easy example, but uh, in games, often you see that uh, a ton of tons of different characters, but you can't design all of them, right? So you'll just generate them. This is also uh, one of them. NFTs, I know almost nothing about, so I'll go through it really quickly. You can create them, and this is also a form of generative art, of course. You can sell them, whatever. So this is also a use case, right? I'm not going to say more about it. Um, GitLab icons that we know um, are also generated randomly. When you start a new GitLab account, you'll get a default icon, but this icon is going to be different from someone else's icon, right? So these are also um, a part or a form of generative art. Yeah, lastly, like I said, it's a really fun concept. I want to leave you with the message. Try playing around with it. It's your turn now. This is what I use. This is where I started. I really recommend this guy. Uh, he starts from scratch. He has some really awesome videos. He does tons of different cool stuff. A Rubik's Cube, uh, Rubik's Cubes, uh, this kind of ASCII art, uh, game of life. If you have <laughs> nice, well done, Adam. <laughs> I, like I like the interactive part as well. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> thanks, thanks. It's funny to, to see yourself, yourself <laughs> in the <laughs> camera. <yeah. laughs> nice, nice one. Uh, so, so two, two completely different subjects, subjects right now. Uh, um, but please, please if you have any questions, questions uh, put, uh, put them in the chat and we will answer them uh, right away to Adam. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool, yeah, I see there's already uh, a bit echo right now. Are we on mute on your laptop, by the way? My laptop not. Right, let's now try it. Are. Now we are, right? So we should not be echoing anymore. Thanks for the chat. As you see, the hiccups are there, but I promise next time we will have, of course, solved these issues. 
<laughs> and uh, yeah, technically we solved it then by next time because we will learn from uh, these small hiccups. Um, yeah, a lot of cool presentations, Adam. Uh, I think you're getting a great response on that. Do you think there's a real, as you mentioned, use case for gaming? Um, but if you could do it at the client for like a 40 hour job or something like that, would you love to do all, Would you love to do that? The thing is, you, you can't do this for a 40 hour job, I think at least, unless you're building something like huge, right? But they are small concepts, which is just considered generative art, but not known as generative art. So that's the cool thing about it, right? But that's why getting started with it and just getting acquainted with it and playing around with it is so cool. But doing this at a client for 40 hours is not something I could imagine. <laughs> yeah. Mm. yeah, but it's definitely useful uh, skills to have. And if you're not necessarily doing it for your generative art skills, you could do it for your math skills because everything I showed you today was just some for loops, some basic JavaScript with just some math. That's it. That's nothing else. Yeah, you see, you can see immediately the result, yeah, right? Exactly. So that's also cool. Yeah. So it fires your passion, basically. Yeah, even better than front end yeah. development. It's not just a button; it's a complete image or a complete video, right? So it's even cooler than that. Yeah. Awesome. I see Emilio also have a question. I do want to. <laughs> yeah, I put it in the chat. You can move that since you're here. No, the the thing you started with the the Shrek in the supermarket stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> I've been looking into how this thing works, and it's basically a, a really large data set of images that is used to train a model, and it basically takes parts of images and combines them yeah. together into one exactly. big image at the end. Yeah. And one of my hobbies is photography. Mm -hmm. And I really don't like it when people take my images and put them <laughs> somewhere else on their own website or take credit for them. Yeah. Where do you think the line lies with this kind of thing where would uh, a thing like Dali uh, count as as theft of images, or do you think it's becoming a completely new creation because it's so unrecognizable still? Because I've seen somebody talk to one of those things and basically have it create a version of Mona Lisa just by describing what he wants to see and how he wants to see it. And I find it hard to imagine that there's not parts of the original Mona Lisa being used in those cases. Yeah, yeah, I've actually done that one myself. I've tried it also as well. And it's definitely the Mona Lisa with some changes to it. So. <laughs> True. Um, it's a very good question, but I think it's more of a philosophical question, right? It is. It's not necessarily something that we as technology nerds can can answer, I think. It's, um, it's a difficult one. Yeah. For me, myself, yeah, it's it's gonna depend. It's the, it's gonna depend on the images you use and how much of the image, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's gonna be a lot of factors. Yeah, yeah, but, uh, yeah. Very good thought. Okay. Something to think about while working on it. Yeah. yeah. Basically, uh, what you code makes impact. So think about what you code as well. Yeah. What uh, yeah. what the end goal is, exactly. of course, uh, because we're also uh, have a responsibility in the yeah. ethical part. True. Okay. Thank you, Adam. Uh, we will close the session uh, off with some uh, last uh, announcements. And after that, uh, everybody can enjoy their evening a bit more and uh, have a nice drink or something else, like grab a snack for the coming time. As you see, this was uh, our second time in the studio. Uh, you saw some small technical hiccups, but you also saw two very good presentations, which I really loved about two different subjects. Uh, Neil and Adam did this in his free did it in the free time, uh, which is really awesome and. We can mention that, I think. <laughs> yeah, both passion, yeah, a lot of passion to see. Um, looking at, we already had a nice year, a different year, uh, because we did some deep dive sessions, but we want to end with something else again. Uh, we want to do a sort of discussion with the design part of the front end side. So let's look about how design, UX impacts uh, front end and the choices being made in there. So there will be again different subjects, different speakers, of course. And for next year, we are trying to improve. So please just chat with us if you want to say something about uh, the quality or want to know, ah, I know a good speaker, please mention it to us. Feel free.
just you have our names, you have our info, and for the giveaway winners, you can contact uh, me directly. And for the last giveaway, um, what is the label element used for? A, B, C, or D? And you can put it in the chat uh, if you want, uh, or else you can email me the answer as well because we're running out of time. <laughs> it's B. <laughs> it's B. <laughs> um, yeah. Any questions for Emil or Adam? I think they're happy to reach out yes. if they have any answers for that. Uh, yeah, that Even will be great. Open. Yes, sir. Nice, great. After this, I hear from uh, our uh, lovely moderator. <laughs> <laughs> and that will be. Scary. Scary moments. Very scary moments. This one, Katrien, you may also stand up, but then oh, so. <laughs> you'll be in the spot uh, for now. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yesterday was your moment to hit uh, the half of the semi-finals of uh, Young Socialist of the Year. Indeed. Indeed. You're doing a lot of great stuff. Also on here uh, with presenting, hosting, organizing, doing a lot of great stuff. So uh, Frank and I would be really honored to uh, to hand over something for all the things you are doing for the community and for this uh, lightning talks and also for uh, for uh, all the front enders around. Great. That's it for me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a, a token of appreciation. Uh, and uh, we all support you in the finals. <laughs> so <laughs> that is what we can do for you. <laughs> Everybody will help. I feel you. the support. Yeah? So that's great. Yeah. Nice. Good luck. Yeah. Good luck. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, thanks. Thank you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> um, I couldn't have done it without you guys. Uh, of course, we're a team, so uh, that's great. And uh, we share the success. And uh, awesome. Let's uh, go for it. Go for it. <laughs> no. yes, I think it's a great ending. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, um, guys, um, we will leave it at this. Uh, for the next time, Adam. And Emil, I hope to see you guys again because it was really awesome to have you here as presenters yes. and the subjects as well. Well, thank you everybody. And uh, I think we can switch off. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>